lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Michael Brown is quite a character. I call him Groucho Marx because he went around for years with the shoe brush mustache trying to look like Groucho Marx. Um, like Groucho Marx, <clears throat> he's an intelligent man who behaves intentionally below his own level of intelligence. So he didn't just look like Groucho Marx, he behaved like Groucho Marx. He turned himself into an entertainer, a man who is actually personally quite intelligent, but who plays a stupid person or a crazy person. That was Groucho Marx, but Groucho Marx, everyone understood what he was doing. He had a character. Well, Michael Brown is much the same. He's a Groucho Marx, always has been. He has his assistant, Scott. That's like his uh, Harpo. Let's go back to the beginning. In the late 1980s, I was living in Israel. There was a major Messianic conference in the late 80s, attended by Arnold Fruchtenbaum and other people. There were a number of Israelis there. During the time of this conference, and just before the conference began, there was a terrible terrorist attack in the Carmel Forest in Israel. Radical Islamic terrorists set forest fires. Now, forestation is emblematic of the rebirth of Israel as a nation. It was deforested under the Turks. Most of the land, of course, was, was either malaria-infested swamps and marshes, or else it was desert. In the irrigation of the desert, there was a national reforestation funded by the Jewish National Fund. To this day, people plant trees in remembrance of Holocaust survivors or family loved ones. Many Christians plant trees in Israel as a gesture of support for what God is doing among his ancient people, things like this. National reforestation is a big deal in Israel. Their, their National Arbor Day, called Tu Bishvat, is elevated to the status of a national holiday virtually. It is a big deal. It is emblematic of the rebirth of, of, of the nation. But with these terrorist attacks, 22% of Israel's national forests were destroyed before they could get it under control. 22% of reforested land was utterly destroyed by Islamic firebombing. Quite a thing. It was a national disaster called the Shabraf in Hebrew, and it was absolutely terrible. It was causing uh, visibility problems for airplanes. The smoke was so thick, all kinds of problems. And uh, massive firefighting efforts in which the military as well as the fire departments were involved. It was absolutely a national disaster. Arrived Michael Brown. Michael Brown announces publicly that as his plane was coming into Israel, the Lord showed him that this was the Holy Spirit pouring out his fire on Israel. A national disaster. And he says it's the Holy Spirit pouring out his fire. Well done, Groucho. At this conference, he has people up the whole night, or at least half the night, probably the whole night. I have a number of witnesses prophesying there was going to be a second Pentecost event, another day of Pentecost, and people were up all night waiting for this thing to happen. Well, obviously, the conference came and went. The forest fires were eventually put out, and Michael Brown got on the airplane and went home. This is Michael Brown, Groucho. Now, Groucho Marx in real life was very much like what he was on screen. Well, so was Michael Brown. He couldn't separate between his character and uh, the real person. Groucho Marx was quite clever to have that kind of wooden humor. Well, Michael Brown is also not a stupid man. He has an actual earned doctorate in Hebrew language. He doesn't speak Hebrew very well. I don't think he speaks it much at all. I attempted to engage him by the telephone conversation in Hebrew. He couldn't speak it, but he certainly would be able to read biblical Hebrew. I believe he did his doctorate at New York University. Um, 
Now, from that faculty is someone I met briefly in Australia, um, an Orthodox rabbi, Dr. Michael Frischman from the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission, a serious scholar, one of the main Hebrew scholars in the world from that faculty. So Michael Brown was not a fraud or a charlatan in the academic sense. He really did have something of a scholarly credibility. He was not a clown in terms of his education. He didn't have a phony doctorate. He wasn't like James White with a phony doctorate. He wasn't like Thomas Ice with a phony doctorate or Rodney Howard Brown with a phony doctorate. He's not that. He had an actually earned doctorate in Hebrew from NYU, Greenwich Village, near where I got saved in Greenwich Village in Manhattan. This was Michael Brown. He made a public spectacle of himself. Story goes on. I was meant to debate a rabbi called Shmuel Boteach, Shmuel Boteach, from the Lechaim Society at Cambridge University. He apparently got copies of some audio cassettes, as it was then, of mine, speaking about Messianic apologetics and showing that the teachings of the rabbis, the Talmud, were supporting the conclusions of Jewish believers and of Christians concerning Old Testament passages that were prophetic of the Messiah and the Tanakh. Well, on 48 hours notice, Shmuelik Boteach or his society canceled the debate. I expect that from Shmuelik Boteach, from an unsaved rabbi or whatever. But a pastor in New Jersey, Pastor Richard Fisher, who authored or co-authored the book, The Strange World of Benny Hinn, set up a debate that was to take place in New Jersey between Michael Brown and myself, because Michael Brown had become the apologist for the counterfeit revival of Pensacola that ended in a financial scandal and a split with he himself falling out with the Assemblies of God establishment. Now, I had met Dr. George Wood, who initially opposed the Toronto phenomena and wrote a booklet opposing it. And I briefly met Dr. Trask, then the head honcho of the Assemblies of God. As soon as the same thing transpired within Assemblies of God circles, however, Thomas Trask changed his tune. He was all for it. Via Holy Trinity Brompton in London with Nicky Gumbel and Sandy Miller, the counterfeit revival of Toronto, of John Arnott and Carol Arnott, was transferred to Pensacola, Florida in its American version. You can watch the video clips online of the outrageous antics that were going on, bearing in mind the fruit of the spirit is self-control. These people were out of control. During the Toronto fiasco, the counterfeit revival, known as the Toronto Experience, the apologist who wrote the book defending it was someone called Guy Chevro, Guy Chevro, who actually lied. He directly lied. Quoting John Wesley in support of the Toronto phenomena, saying that this kind of out of control hysterics took place during the great revivals of John Wesley. He gives the page reference to a book called Daniel Rowland and the Great Revivals, published in the UK. But when we turn to the page reference, although John Wesley certainly indicated emphatically that the wild hysterics and, and laughing phenomena did take place during his revivals, he said it was demonic. He said it was devilish. Yet Chevro, the apologist for Toronto, takes something that Wesley says was devilish and totally misrepresents Wesley, saying in a positive sense that it happened during John Wesley's revivals, failing to tell people that John Wesley condemned it as of demonic origin. Well, Guy Chevro was the apologist for the counterfeit revival in Toronto. It's American clone in Pensacola, where it was transferred from Toronto via Holy Trinity Brompton, or better called Holy Trinity Bedlam, to Brownsville Assemblies of God in Pensacola, Florida, was Michael Brown and his assistant, Scott, or as I call them, Groucho and Harpo. This is what happened. Michael Brown wrote a book saying, let no one deceive you, postulating to defend these wild phenomena captured on videotape and well documented, as well as the absurd doctrines taking place at this failed and counterfeit revival in Pensacola, Florida, which obviously brought no revival. 
Now, Holy Trinity Brompton was an interesting place. I confronted George Carey, the formerly evangelical Archbishop of Canterbury, who wrote the book, The Meeting of Waters, calling the Pope the Holy Father and trying to come back under Rome in complete rejection of the 39 Articles of the Church of England the ecumenical agenda. I confronted him in Tel Aviv at the airport. I spoke Hebrew to his escorts from the Ministry of Religious Affairs. He thought I was Israeli. And I confronted him about something that took place in London. At Southern Cathedral, where Christians were martyred under Queen Mary in the aftermath of the Reformation, there was the first homosexual and lesbian service taking place. You had Anglican clergy, men and women, lesbians, homosexuals, dressed in their Anglican vestments and garb, holding hands and kissing on television. This was the first time this happened. There was a very thin line of protesters in front of the cathedral. That same night of the week, that same night of the week this was going on, when the president was set and when everyone was watching on the BBC News, this gay and lesbian service, as they called it, of Anglican clergy now, men with dancing and costumes and all sorts at a place where Christians had once been martyred, right across the Thames, right across the river in Holy Trinity, Brompton. Sandy Miller and Nikki Gumbel were conducting a fiasco. There were people on the floor in hysterics, in open hysterics. Holy Trinity, Brompton, rolling and laughing, saying God was doing a great thing. This is how sick and perverted the Toronto phenomena was. But via that church in London, it comes to Pensacola. And there, the apologist is not Mark DuPont, but Michael Brown. Now, Michael Brown had written a book that Moriel once distributed, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood. Again, he's not a stupid man, and he says good things at times. He said a number of good things. Like myself, he entered in an online confrontation with the hyper-Calvinist James White, He's stood even on the homosexual issue. Not everything Michael Brown has done is wrong. Unfortunately, the good things he has managed to do have simply masqueraded or camouflaged the deception. I was scheduled to debate Michael Brown at the arrangement and orchestration of Pastor Fisher, who was a pastor of a Baptist church in Brick, New Jersey. This was a summer, summer peak season for vacation travelers and so forth, schools are out, etc. Very difficult to get tickets that summer. Not only were the prices up, but British Airlines had a strike, meaning a lot of the transatlantic flights between Britain and America were canceled, and what seats were available on other airlines were all scoffed up because of the seat shortage due to the BA strike. Nonetheless, somehow, my travel agent in Leeds, England at that time, managed to get tickets for myself and my family. I decided to bring my family with me, and then we would take the kids, they were much smaller, to Disneyland and to see their grandmother and family things and have a summer holiday vacation in uh, America after the debate. So I arranged to fly into Newark, New Jersey with my family for the debate before having the family vacation. Lucky to get the tickets. It was the Lord's hand. I suppose I could even get the tickets under the circumstances. Then I get a phone call from Pastor Fisher. Michael Brown is canceling. He wants to reschedule. The original arrangement was the debate would be held midweek so people would not have to miss their own Sunday services in their own church and would be held at a neutral venue. Michael Brown demands that it be held on a Sunday night in a pro Pensacola church. He had to load the dice after he found out I had video copies of what was going on in Pensacola. A lunatic asylum. They were saying... The river's going to come. It'll be here at 7.30. Get ready. The river's going to come. And they had a countdown. And at 7.30, they begin swimming as if they were in a river. The words to the river song by Lendl Cooley, the lyrics were not even scriptural. 
The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. There is no doxology without theology, as I once heard a great preacher from Northern Ireland enunciate. Then we had John Kilpatrick. He prophesied Hank Hanegraaff was going to be brought down by God for criticizing Pensacola as a counterfeit. Lo and behold, Kilpatrick himself falls off a roof, breaks his pelvis, <coughs> and then three months later is brought out in a wheelchair. I'm no great admirer of Hank Hanegraaff for sure. He was defeated solidly in a debate by Dr. Mark Hitchcock as he should have been. Nonetheless, it was not Hank Hanegraaff who the Lord broke, brought down. It was rather John Kilpatrick coming out of the wheelchair with a broken pelvis. The false prophecy blew up in his face. Another video clip was a girl looked like she was palsy. She was vibrating like crazy. Now, folks, when you see someone like this <clears throat> and you just make a snap judgment and you see someone doing something like this, you may say, oh, man, you know, what's going on? But I want to tell you, this girl, she's a brilliant girl. Her mother's a school teacher. Her father's a doctor, a medical doctor. And these girls have been raised in Brownsville Assembly. I know their life, and they're godly girls. But God, during this revival, has gotten a hold of them. And her sister is Elizabeth that's given her testimony on television and here on Friday night in the church. And this is Allison. And God uses her. Uh, when it comes time for the altar call and things like that, he uses her in intercession. And you'll see her back there really under the power of the Holy Spirit beginning to intercede for lost souls. And she's never done anything like this. I've known her for many years. I've known these girls since they were little bitty girls. I mean like this, I've known them. I've been their pastor. But I know beyond any doubt whatsoever that these girls are being moved on by God's Spirit. And Allison, if you can, sweetheart, I want you to take just a moment and just share what the Lord's doing in your life and what's going on. Okay. I'm 19 years old, and um, I've been through high school, and I'm in college now. And at the beginning of this revival, I didn't come for the first week. I, I was like everyone else. I wasn't so sure about it. And um, church had always been kind of a, just a requirement anyway. So it was the second Sunday of this revival that I came to the, the night service. And um, uh, Steve preached on, um, I have a verse for it. Um, In Matthew 6, um, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And what Steve preached about that night was you cannot hold on to the hand of God and on to the hand of the world at the same time. And uh, all through high school and college, I've, I've known God, well, God has had a place in my heart, but he didn't really have a place in my life. And I never thought that God had anything to offer other than just sitting at church. And I'd never given him a chance to do anything in my life. So I was constantly running after the world. I was running after what I, I thought I had to have something that the world would give me. But whenever I heard that, what Steve preached, I'm, my eyes were opened, like Steve preached last night. Um, Satan, he blinds us. And I, I was blinded by worldly things that I thought I had to have and worldly friends that I thought I had to have. And all it took to totally change my life was for me to, to, to listen and, and really hear what these people, these men of God are trying to say what God is trying to say. You know, the Bible says people, they have ears to hear, but 
they don't hear what people are trying to say and what God is trying to say to, say to them. And um, I listened that night, and God totally opened my eyes. He, he changed my whole life. I was terribly depressed because I, I had enough of God in me to know what I was doing was wrong and to be miserable doing it. And I was in the most horrible position you can be in. God says himself, he'd rather spit you out of his mouth than to have you be lukewarm because you're no good to anybody unless you're hot or cold. So, I'm hot now. <laughs> that happened to me the first week of the revival and, uh, <laughs> and like they say you don't have to search after the manifestation the manifestation is on me now but it wasn't for a long time I came to lots of meetings and I got prayed for and I never felt anything physically happen but my whole life was transformed and now God has given me the gift of intercession and um, he has, he's allowed me to feel, the Holy Spirit has allowed me to feel just part of the pain that he feels whenever people don't listen to him. I've realized that the Holy Spirit, he's here, he's waiting on all of us just a, a, a tiny bit of our heart to want him. He'll come in and change your whole life. He'll change everything. Yes, will. Everything. Whenever, whenever this is on you, Allison, you don't have pain, do you? No, it, it's not painful at all. You know, <laughs> you know seriously, seriously, Whenever someone sees someone like this that, that, that's manifesting the Spirit of the Lord, they think they're under pain or they're under duress. But it's not like that at all. Tell them what it's like. Well, there's two different kinds with me. Like right now, I think the glory of God is so strong up here, my body just can't really take it. And that, that's why I'm doing this. But there's other times whenever I come into God's presence and um, I don't move at all, but inside me, it's like there's just waves of God inside of me. Right. And then there's other times whenever I'm interceding, and it's not painful to my body, but it's painful to my heart because I know that God loves people so much, and He's, he's, he's in a hurry. He, he wants, he wants, he wants everyone. He, there's not much, not much more time. And he, he aches and he, he grieves for your spirit. He grieves for you. <laughs>
standing there lying through his teeth that this girl was from a good family and he knew her family, so therefore that was to authenticate the validity of her vibrating like she needed a emergency medical treatment for a severe grand mal seizure or epileptic fit. She looked like she was seriously ill, like an epileptic or something. And began prophesying while shaking. And he said, she comes from a good family. Her mother's a teacher. Her father's a physician. It turns out the girl came from a broken home. Her parents separated when she was a little girl, broke up when she was a little girl. Kilpatrick lied through his teeth. And here's the apologist, the defender of this thing that ends in a scandal and a split, Michael Brown. No wonder he canceled the debate. Now he's singing the praises of Bill Johnson, the mystic and the Gnostic from Northern California. And we, in in this journey, we've had the Lord show up and do a, a number of amazing things. One of the prominent things that we've seen in these years is the healing of people's bodies, the deliverance, deliverances from torment, restoration of families, all those kinds of things have been uh, so extraordinary, so amazing. Occasionally we have unusual things happen that we, I, I don't take a service for, I, I just don't, I'll make reference and then I leave it alone. and. That's typically my response to the signs that make you wonder. And uh, it would be about 15 or maybe 14 years ago, somewhere in that area, 14 years ago probably, that feathers started just appearing and falling in meetings. And then they started falling in our homes and in restaurants and things like that, just unusual things. So, you know, there are signs that make you wonder. There are, there, people say, where's that in the Bible? Well, he said he'd cover you with his feathers. Yeah, well, that's not literal, and that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I thought it wasn't literal. It also says uh, there's healing in his wings. Should make somebody happy. But things like that happen. We'll have wind that will gust of wind that I'll get hit with. And I mean, not imaginary things, you know. People get weird, and I, I understand they want something... They want something supernatural bad, so bad, they start imagining things. And I understand that problem will probably always be with us. But that is no reason to discount what he does do. <clears throat> and uh, we've had gold dust appear in people's hands for years. We, I don't ever talk about it, but frequently during worship, we actually had it today. Benny and I both saw gold will start falling during worship. This time I think it started falling during our prayer time. And we'll just see, just drop like rain. And, uh, and I mean, we just, you, you can't invite God into the house and not have something outside of your box happen. <laughs> he's, he's just slightly bigger than our understanding. He, yeah. <clears throat> so we have these things happen. They happen with regularity. Uh, sometimes there are things that we go honestly for maybe years even without understanding what in the world happened and why. But it happened at such a key moment, there's no way to question that it was the Lord. August 12th, uh, our children's pastor actually preached that night on grace. And late that Friday, it was a Friday night. I was out of the country somewhere, I forget where I was, Sweden or somewhere. <clears throat> And at the end, they had a fire towel and started ministering to people, and this glory cloud just came and just started hovering somewhere over the platform. I'm not sure where that one was, but there's this cloud. It was cloud. It's hard to explain. It looks like smoke, looks like dust, and when you get close, it's like gold. It's, it's shiny. It's like little flakes, teeny, weeny little flakes, and they're just swirling. The next week, the 19th of August was a women's conference. And the same thing happened again. I know that that night it was over in that corner. And then this last Friday night, this cloud appeared again. And this time it remained there for approximately 45 minutes. It would intensify, it, was, it would get thick, it would 
there was at one time there was like the smoke billowing and it exploded. It was like a ball. It exploded and just shot up all of the gold. You can, I'm going to show you a little clip and it looked like smoke to you. You'll see some little sparkles, but it's, it's like, um, it's it's like gold flakes and they all went up. They they happened over in that corner. But as we were walking around the stage here, I would get back in here and it's just swirling up in the ceiling up in there. It's just probably from about this side of the room over was just everywhere. We had people standing on the stage, just were, were just dumbfounded, you know. <laughs> One of our staff this morning made a comment, not meant to be humorous, just, uh, just uh, it, it felt like I was looking at a UFO, you know. <laughs> I mean, you don't have a slot to put it in, is, is that kind of a thing. I mean, we realize there's glory in the Bible, there's the smoke of his presence. I understand all that, but it's different from when you read it to where you're in it. And we'd have, I'd have a friend this close, and I would see this stuff go right between us. It was that, it was that close. It was like right here. And um, we're going to pray into this actually, because there's a specific target that I feel like the Lord wants to, uh, wants us to take. Chris, as we were talking about this morning, as a team, leadership team, he, he prayed, shared something, prayed this prayer that I think is so strong, so prophetic. The, uh, the signs, the wonders that were displayed through Moses. Those were all plagues. This is New Testament. This is the hour of grace. I feel like there's just going to be things that happen. I, I, I feel a little strange in saying, I feel like there's things that are going to happen when they've been happening for years and years and years. But does it make any sense to you? I feel like he's intensifying it. He's upping it. He's increasing it. You got that video ready? If you've got that video ready, why don't you? It's just about 15 seconds. And I want to put a large piece together if I can get some of you to send me what you have. All right, just, yeah, hold it right there. You can see right next to the screen, you see that kind of smoke there. Uh, well, just watch. Go ahead. All right, run it back again. Start it over. <laughs> okay, run it back again. Now pause it. Just pause it there for a second. There we go. For those of you that were here, uh, you remember, now this has happened all three times on Friday nights, late, late into the evening. It started about 11.30, went till about 12.15, if, if I have my numbers right. But there was such intense worship, such intense worship. And and childlike wonder at what's happening. And uh, the, the, I wouldn't normally even show this to you, except I really believe there's a, there's a prophetic point to what God is going to be releasing. Go ahead and play it again. I got to see it again. <laughs> Can you see the sparkles in the cloud? <laughs> That's good. Thanks. You can turn it off and turn the lights up. What do you think of that? Wow. It's pretty amazing. Isn't it? amazing. <clears throat> and I've had several things happen through the years that that were so ridiculously supernatural, but they were so natural that I had a hard time adjusting to what he was doing. Does that make sense? It it didn't come with a thunderous voice and it was like smoke. His spirituality is not scriptural. It is not spirituality. It is mysticism. His mishandling of scripture is Gnosticism. 
So it's difficult to expect the same fruit of the early church when we value a book they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have. <clears throat> it's not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. No, this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. But you've got to understand, you approach this book with this reverence. It is the Spirit of God that makes it living. Paul warned us. He said, the, the letter kills. How many wars have been fought with this book? Not just because of it. With the book. How many times do Christians chop off the ear of the opposing, the opponent, you know, with Scripture? Wanting to prove themselves correct. You know, it's, it's, it's the Spirit of God that makes this thing come alive to where we actually have the privilege of the Word becoming flesh in us again. His daughter-in-law, Jenny Johnson, the Holy Spirit is like a sneaky blue genie. I feel, I feel like I'm supposed to ask you to ask him some questions today. And I want you to go to him and ask him to define who he is to you and what that looks like. So my God, God to me, Jesus to me, and the Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin. That's black. I don't, I don't agree. That's whole, I, I don't care. That's who he is to me. And he's funny. And he's sneaky. He's silly. He's wonderful. He's like the wind. He's, he's all around. You know the scene in Revelations where the angels circle the throne? And they say, holy. And you just, you, it's this reverent, like, holy. Every time they, they circle the throne, they say, see a new side of his face. And they're just taken aback. And it's all they can do to say, holy. And they just keep circling because... There's never an end. It's limitless to what they see as they circle. And I was thinking yesterday, I thought, <laughs> I wonder how much they laugh. Because he's funny. I wonder how much he just goes, like, yeah, look at this. <laughs> and they're like, What part of happy is in reverent? I'm, I'm, I'm just asking. I don't know. It's nonsense they're into. And I thought of those angels circling that throne and I thought, I bet they text each other. I bet they have farting contests. That is black. I don't... Get her off the stage. That is irreverent. It turned white, just so you know, as a foe. God's a heck of a lot more fun than we think he is. Episode. Don't believe me? Watch it for yourself. These clips are on YouTube. You had Todd Bentley. Well, I just had an encounter with the Lord. The last 10 minutes. God really surprised me. Rebuked me. And I'm going to repent. You know, the Lord told me we've offended the supernatural. In fact, the Lord said to me, he goes, Todd, you've offended the supernatural. And I said, God, I love the supernatural. Anybody that knows our ministry knows I love the supernatural. I have a supernatural school coming up. And I'm thinking, God, I'm known for supernatural ministry signs and wonders. I love the supernatural. There's more controversy out there about the supernatural and about my testimony and the angel of the Lord than anything else. 
He said, that's why I want to rebuke you. And I said, what did I do, Lord? He said, because of the controversy and all the talk about Emma and all the people that want to ask me about the angel of the Lord and the healing angel, I've held back. What do I, what do I mean I've held back? And whether you know our ministry or not, this is to the Lord. He said, you've held back the testimony of when the angel comes. And when I felt the presence of the Lord, and we're talking about an angel of healing. And only one time in the last six months has that angel been here in a real manifest way. And I can tell you the day it happened. I even told people the day before it happened. And that was in January. One day. We called it the return of the angel. The Lord said the healing angel will make his return on this day. It was on a Wednesday. Was it the 13th? January? The 13th. The Lord told me on January the 12th. He said the healing angel will make his return to Morningstar on January the 13th. The Lord spoke to me in an audible voice and told me the healing angel would make his return. Not since Lakeland, Florida. And he said, the angel will make his return on the 13th. It was a Wednesday night. We were wall to wall. People in the balconies. And the angel of the Lord came. And the gift of revelation and the word of knowledge and the gift of healing began to operate. And we were wall to wall on January the 13th. The night the angel, the Lord spoke to me audibly, January the 12th. He said, the healing angel that you have known in your ministry, that was a part of what happened in Lakeland, Florida, you cannot deny the testimony of the angel of the Lord. Nass, it's all about Jesus, and I'm preaching on the cross and the resurrection. Enough for all that. I've got to stop holding back and denying the testimony of the supernatural. Because of the controversy, I pulled back and I said, God, I'm not going to talk about the angel anymore. Forget all this, the healing angel. People get all freaked out. and It's probably the biggest controversy in our ministry is my testimony that I had an angelic encounter 10 years ago that launched my healing ministry from the Lord. Criminally convicted bisexual pedophile who says he became a Christian and after becoming a Christian has himself covered with tattoos head to foot, including on his face and neck. He says he has an angel, a female angel, where is that in scripture? Named Emma visiting him, which has since become another angel called International Banker. This is Bentley. Bill Johnson, joined by C. Peter Wagner, Che On from Los Angeles, and Rick Joyner, lay hands on him and prophesy over Todd Bentley that he's going to lead a great revival. The whole time he was involved in adultery. 72 hours later, 72 hours after Johnson prophesies over him, Bentley abandons his handicapped wife and their three children. He abandons his wife and children, worse than a pagan and an unbeliever. Takes off with this woman he's been having the adultery with, divorces his Christian wife, marries the harlot wife, as scripture would define her, and now she's with him prophesying. A couple of nights ago, I had a dream where Oral Roberts was speaking to Todd. They were, I, don't, I didn't understand what they're saying, but I remember they were talking. And then he looked over and he saw me and he stopped and he ran over to me and he put his hands over my eyes and he said, what do you see? And so I looked and I didn't see anything at first and then all of a sudden I saw this elephant racing across my eye. And Oral Roberts said, he put his, his hands over my eyes and said, what do you see? And I said, I didn't see anything at first, and then all of a sudden I saw this elephant racing across my eyes, and it was, it was dancing, it was going crazy, it was just, it had this big smile, and it was just, just going crazy, and I said, it's a, a wild elephant, I see a wild elephant, and then I said, what's, what's with the elephant? He said, exactly, what is it with the elephant? And then I looked again, and in, in that vision, what was highlighted was the trunk of the elephant. I said, it's the elephant nose, and he said, yes. I said, it's discernment. 
And he said, exactly. And then he says, do you see the lion? And I closed my eyes again, and then I saw the lion. And the lion, it was just a golden lion, and I woke up. And um, when I woke up, literally, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just felt like the Lord was highlighting things to me about the dream. And in the dream, I thought it was pretty ironic that Oral Roberts put his hands, he covered my eyes and said, what do you see? And I thought that was interesting because he's covering my eyes. What do you see? And I felt like the Lord was saying that, that even more so now for the church today, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. What do you see? You know, I didn't see anything at first until I really looked and I pressed in, you know, and I saw the wild elephant. And so when the elephant came running in and I said, what is it with it? So it's almost like, what's with walking by faith? How do you walk by faith and not by sight? By discerning the times and the seasons, just like the sons of Ishkar, discerning. That's what gives you hope when you're walking through a hard time and you're, you know, walk by faith when everything around you looks dark and dim. Is discerning the times and seasons by getting a hope from God. Um, whew, getting... <laughs> Getting a hope from God <laughs> to be able to see, to discern the times and the seasons that's ahead of you. And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant. It was a wild elephant, a wild elephant. It was radical, 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 radical. <laughs> wow. And the elephant means a great impact. And I really felt like what happened in Lakeland was just a beginning, it was just an introductory, it was just an introduction, just a table of content of what's to come. And Rick Joyner and these guys have restored him to ministry. This is Bill Johnson. Open immorality means nothing. False prophecy means nothing. Why wouldn't Michael Brown support a false prophet? He proved himself to be a false prophet in Jerusalem in the late 1980s. Ask him to deny it. The real tragedy of Michael Brown is he knows better. He doesn't have a phony doctorate like these clowns that he consorts with. He really is capable of better things in the area of messianic apologetics and Jewish evangelism. He is capable of better things. Groucho Marx was an innocuous entertainer. Michael Groucho Brown is not innocuous. He has sugar-coated poison and fed it to the body of Christ. He did this in Jerusalem. He did this in Pensacola. And now with Bill Johnson, he is doing it again. You backed out the last time, Michael Brown. Come and debate me. Let's begin by debating what happened at that conference in Jerusalem when the forest fires were destroying national reforestation in Israel, a terrible disaster that you said was the Holy Spirit pouring out his fire, and you had the people up all night. We'll begin by debating that. Then we'll show the film clips of Pensacola and the palsy girl and the people swimming in the river. Then we'll debate that. Then we'll debate Bill Johnson laying hands on Todd Bentley. Then we'll debate that. Come on, Michael. You're a git Yiddish kid. You're a nice Jewish boy. We both come from New York. We'll even debate in Hebrew if you want to. Come on, Michael. I'm ready. But you won't come this time for the same reason you didn't come the last time. You turned and ran. Well, keep on running. You're bamboozling a lot of people, but you're not conning the Lord. Pensacola was no revival. Bill Johnson is a mystic and a Gnostic. And that terrible, terrible terrorist attack in Israel, in which a number of people died in those forest fires and a number of forest firefighters and military personnel died 
fighting those fires. That was not the Holy Spirit being poured out, Michael Brown. The real shame and disgrace is that you know better. Come on, Groucho. Bring Harpo with you. I'm ready when you are. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. But if you close your eyes where you're praying for somebody, you're going to miss it. Because what happens is you begin to pray, and you're praying, and you're releasing, and you may say one word, and that may be a trigger for them, and they just lose it. Or they'll begin to cry. And you'll look at, if you're looking at them, you'll be say, oh, we hit something here. Let's go after this. Let's pray into this. So keep your eyes open when you're praying for somebody. I know that sounds strange, but it, it really does work. And you'll look at, if you're looking at them, you'll be say, oh, we hit something here. Let's go after this. So keep your eyes open when you're praying for somebody. I know that sounds strange, but it, it really does work. It, it really does work. Maryland. Maryland, thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for that oil coming right now for healing. In Jesus' mighty name, release that. Do you have any children? No children. Because I, I'm just laying hands on you, and, and I, I feel like there, there's just something in that realm right now that God's going to release. I don't, it doesn't mean you're going to have natural children. It could be I'm picking up on it because you've never been married never had children. But the Lord's highlighting that to me for whatever the reason right now. I feel like you're a real Hannah in the spirit to, and that you've really dedicated anything that the Lord's given to you to the Lord. And in the same way in which Hannah dedicated Samuel. It was God had to open her womb in the first place. But prophetically, she dedicated anything in which God had given her um, to the Lord. And here's what Samuel's name means. It means God is heard. So there's something of the burden that you're carrying in which God is saying God is heard. And you're like, Hannah in the spirit, but uh, I don't know, but the Lord highlighted to me that that very thing right now in Jesus mighty name. So hi Mary, how you doing? Is there a cancer or something? Okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Do you work in medicine or nursing or anything like that? Have you done anything in that area? You're going to do something in the area of the nation's missions with children as far as medicine and healing, relief, mercy, compassion, ministry type stuff like that. In Jesus name, release that to you right now. It, it really does work. I had, a, I had a pastor say some things that hurt me really bad. Hurt me so bad, messed me up emotionally, mentally, really messed me up. Nothing physical, nothing like that. A, a, a pastor I, I really respected said some words and hurt me so bad. And one time I was laying on the floor, actually it was in this room, I'm laying on the floor and in, an, in a vision, in an encounter with God, in a vision, Jesus picks me up and holds me so close that I can't see anything. And he holds me so close and Jesus starts to weep and he says, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I said, what are you talking about? Please forgive you. He said, when that pastor hurt you, it's as if I hurt you because he's a member of my body. Please forgive me. One of the most like ridiculous, like spooky church <laughs> story I have from the hospital is that I was taking care of a man who was unconscious 
and he was dying and I had no way of communicating with him. I didn't know if he was saved. I didn't know anything really. And I was in the room and his heart rate just started to drop really fast. And I was just like, Jesus, I don't even know if he knows you. Like, what, what do I do in this situation? And I just heard him say, if you forgive his sins, he'll be forgiven. <laughs> And I'm like, am I allowed to do this? I don't really know about this. But so I just started to intercede for him and just release God's presence over him. Just tell him, like, your sins have been forgiven. The Father is going to just meet you today. You can enter into God's kingdom tonight. And within a few minutes, he passed away. And I'm like, you know what? This is amazing. I can't believe I have the, the I don't know. It's just God has put you in places where he gives you so much responsibility and so much authority to carry out what he wants to do. It's like you never know who you're going to meet in the last second of their life to bring people into God's kingdom. It's okay. Um, I am the director of children's ministries here at Bethel Church, which is a, yeah. Yes, it is the best ministry. But basically, um, I have the the tremendous privilege of looking at a generation that I believe is unlike any generation that earth has ever known and being a guardian and an equipper of not only the young but those people who lead the young. Well, we have amazing children that are doing things that are absolutely astonishing. We have uh, just finished a leader's advance. We have this great thing uh, that we do as a the prophetic teams will prophesy over every single person that comes to these advances. And we had 44 kids prophesying over a two-day period of time. And, uh, you know, we had two days of teams, and the 9- and 10-year-olds were on the first day. And they, they joined the second-year school of ministry students, and they begin to prophesy. Now, at first, the students who have not worked with children prophesying think, is that cute? And then they hear them prophesy, and they fall off their chairs. Um, <laughs> we had the 9- and 10-year-olds the first day. There were two kids sick the second day, and when we went in to find a substitute, the whole fifth-grade class volunteered to come in. Now, saying that, they had just been spending three and a half hours prophesying over perfect strangers with one 15-minute break. And they couldn't wait to get back and do it again. But one of the testimonies that we got was when one of these little nine-year-old girls was in one of the booths, there was a pastor who came that was from a traditional charismatic church and said, you know, we believe in prophecy, but we really don't do this, so I'm a little nervous about what's about to happen. And as he was sharing with Nancy Cobb afterwards, he said, I have three life verses. God's just given me three life verses. And when I sat down in the chair, the nine-year-old girl took the tape recorder and recited every single verse. It didn't take a lot to convince him afterwards that God was capable of speaking through the prophetic. But this is the type of thing that would be happening over and over and over again. We've got these kids that hear his voice clearly. When we teach children how to prophesy, it isn't a game to us. Imagine being a generation of children who clearly learn how to hear his voice from the time they're eight years old. Who are they when they're 20? What kind of leader in the church are they when they're 30? There's a confidence that comes to them that's amazing and it's incredible to watch. And see, I teach adults the prophetic and I teach children the prophetic. The difference between those two is that the adults will go through this battle. Is that me? Is that, is, did I already know? Is that God? Is that my enemy? Or is that, and they'll go through this war. You tell children God wants to talk to them and they go, cool. Well, I saw blue. And, and, they, and it's a very easy process for them. There isn't a battle in them unless you become, as a little child, you can't enter the kingdom. You see, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's now. What he's asking us to do is to put away being so sophisticated that we forget that it's, the gospel is very, very simple. We had this tongues and interpretation session, and B. Kuhn is going to be the teacher. She's my children's pastor at Twin View. And she asks these kids, 100, about 125 kids, how many of you already have your prayer language? 70 of them stood up. And I'm thinking, 
okay, God is sending us geniuses now. Why did you come to my conference? You know, because normally we're, you know, we're introducing children to things. So we had these 70 kids form two sides of a fire tunnel, and they just spoke in tongues, in their own little tongues. And then we had all the other kids who wanted their prayer language to walk through the fire tunnel as many times as they wanted to until they began to speak in tongues. We had 35 kids within a half an hour that received their prayer languages. We had parents calling us going, my child got their prayer language. They've been praying forever for this. Wake said they walked through the tunnel. Mine said he got his prayer language during worship last night before we even prayed and taught them. But one of the things that happened while these kids, and the presence of God was so unique, when children are in charge, there, there isn't an agenda. And, and I know, I don't mean that critically like there is with adults, but it is different when they just simply come and be in his presence. So we have these row, these lines of children praying in the spirit, these new children walking through and they're praying in their prayer language. So I'm on the microphone and I'm singing prophetically over this room while it's happening. And this nine-year-old girl comes walking up to me. She reaches up and takes the microphone out of my hand. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, ha, ha honey. And so, but she takes the microphone and she begins to sing in her prayer language over the room. And it's extraordinary. Now I'm just going, yeah. I'm taking credit for that, okay, you know? I, I mean, seriously, you've got, you know, it's my job. Um, so when the whole thing is over and these kids are all over the floor and they're having a great time, I spend a minute with this little girl and I say, so did you already have your prayer language when you came to the conference? And she goes, no. And I said, so when you sang in your prayer language, have you ever sang over a microphone a song using your prayer language before? She said, no. I said, so, okay, you're telling me that the very first time you took a mic away from me so that you could pray and sing over the room in your prayer language. And the thing is, is that that was a completely normal event for her because she was just doing what she saw us doing. You see, unless you become as a little child, she wasn't, first of all, this room is chaos. I, there's tongues everywhere, bodies everywhere, children everywhere, and she just begins to sing. See, she's not trying to be famous. She's just doing what she was created to do. See, it's her destiny to begin to release the presence of God over rooms full of people. And, and she had a great, great start. That was an amazing... <laughs> I, we, have, we get these testimonies. The little bitty kids are the, are the greatest amazing things to me. We heard this testimony of, of, of friends were visiting each other and they overheard their two, three, and four-year-old little girls playing Raise the Dead. Now... <laughs> Three-year-old, you lay on the ground and you be dead first. Three years old, you be dead first and I'm going to resurrect you. And so you, they, the, the parents are like <laughs> looking around the door and, they, and the children are just going, okay, I command you to be alive in the name of Jesus. And the dead child gets up and they both celebrate. And now it's, okay, now it's your turn. You lay on the floor. And so they just were taking turns playing raising the dead. Now... <laughs> Uh, the other testimony that I heard that was so great that was like that is this one little girl comes in and she's got both of her arms shoved down in her t-shirt and she comes out to her grandma and she goes, Nana, pray for my arms to grow up. She's three years old, okay? Pray for my arms to grow up. Now, so, of course, your, her Nana obeys and I command this arm so she wiggles and wiggles and the arm pops out and she goes, okay, and they celebrate. Now pray for the other one to grow up. Now, <laughs> think about the mindset that exists in a three-year-old child that their games are now full of the supernatural. Pray for my arms to grow out? I'm not sure I would do that. N never mind. I, that was an extraordinary thing. You see, what we're finding is happening in the children is they are being immersed in a culture that gives them permission to be free in who they said they were going to be, or who he said they were going to be. And, oh, I have one more thing to show you that's so cool. Okay, we, we take our kids to heaven. I mean, who doesn't, okay? Our kids go to heaven. <laughs> And, and people that know how to do heaven things take them to heaven. And so we have a middle school that, that was tour guides. Is that what they're called? Okay. They take our, our middle school kids to heaven. So we had this one, they get crazy, you know? And so the kids all came rushing, this little bundle of kids came rushing up to Mr. Mayor and said, Mr. Mayor, we all went to heaven together and we saw the same thing. And he goes, stop. 
He said, I want you to go to that corner, you go to that corner, and you go to that corner. And I don't want you to talk to each other about what you saw. Just draw a picture of what you saw. Okay, you are not, I mean, even I. And, and I believe, okay? Um, show the first, can you show the first picture? <laughs> These middle school kids said, we saw, a, we saw a path of rocks and then a stream, and we saw a lamppost that had a jewel right on the top of it. And so when they drew these pictures, they brought this to Mr. Mayor. Now, show, me, show, show us the second one. The children who did not talk to each other said, we saw rocks that were, were leading up, and we saw a lamppost with a jewel on the top. Now show them the third picture. Now, I'm sorry, but that's fun. Okay, you want to know if you're really going to heaven. Okay, you know, you don't, don't go. But, but these guys, they think it's really cool. They meet each other. They, they see each other in heaven, hang out. I, I mean, the, the neat thing about it is it is real to them because it is real, you guys. They're not learning like little tools and little, little things to do. They are becoming encounterers of God. They are in the kingdom because the kingdom is at hand and we're just... Sending out tour guides.